Um, we have promised that we would hear from all four of the campaigns, the leading campaigns, and so we invite as well uh, Donald Trump's campaign to send a representative. And joining us from uh, the Donald, supporting Donald Trump is the Utah Attorney General. Sean Reyes is the highest ranking law enforcement officer of Filipino origin in the United States working today, and he is speaking on behalf of his candidate, Donald Trump. It's great. Thank you very much, Joey. Thank you. Before I begin, ladies and gentlemen, I need to take care of a critical item of business, so if you will indulge me for just a moment. Okay, this side, get your photo bomb on. Terrific. Thank you, thank you. And thank you, Joey, for the introduction. Let me start by saying this afternoon, aloha. aloha. Kind of weak. So the <laughs> idea is I say it and then you say it back with some spirit. So let's try it again. It's not political. It's just a greeting. Aloha. aloha. Very nice. Now how about this one? Mabuhai. Okay. There we go. See, now I've got all the Filipinos spotted right there. Very, very good. Konnichiwa. Very nice. And now the very Asian Pacific Island greeting of hola. Thank you. Thank you for indulging me. I've now satisfied all the members of my family worldwide. I need to just thank you. It's a pr privilege to be here. I want to again thank Joey for the introduction. Thank the AAJA for this opportunity to come and speak um, for APIA uh, vote. Um, and for the work that you do. Um, it's, a, it's a privilege to work together across political um, boundaries uh, with people like my good friend Floyd Morey over the years and a number of these organizations. To be able to, regardless of your political stripes or where you are on the political spectrum, work towards having more of a voice for Asian American Pacific Islanders. So again, it is a, it is a pleasure. I want to thank you. Some caveats, though, because I am a lawyer, so they're obligatory. The first caveat is we have so many acronyms. So there's AAPI, APIA, APA, and in an effort to just be as succinct as possible, I'm going to say APA without trying to offend anybody. You want to debate that later on, we can. We file a grievance and we can work on that. N number two. I hate politicians, um, which might come as a surprise to you because I'm a public elected official, but let me tell you why. Definition of politics, any of you heard this before? Comes from two root words, so the etymology, two cognates, the first being poly, which means what? Many. Many, and ticks, which are little blood-sucking insects, and when you put the two together, <laughs> that is the definition of politics because politics, I think, as I'm defining them, are inherently selfish. Politicians are the embodiment of politics because they ask, what's in it for me? What can a particular title, what can a office do for me and advance my ambitions, my goals? Conversely, public servants ask the opposite question, and that is, what can I do to serve the office, the people that it represents? And I do want to say that we have a lot of public servants, people that I admire, um, on both sides of the aisle, Democrats, Republicans, those of other affiliations in the APA community, and I want to pay tribute to them. Many of them in my state were the pioneers who opened doors for me to be able to be the first minority elected statewide official in our, in our state's history, and without them and their courage and valor, again, uh, across party lines, um, I wouldn't be here uh, representing you or my state as the Attorney General. Now, the last caveat that I want to make is, uh, I've been told that this is a, an Asian Pacific Island audience, largely. And it sure looks like one, but I want to do one little test. This is not uh, stereotyping. This is just me sharing some of my life experiences, and I'm going to invite you to clap if any of them resonate with you, if you can relate to them. Again, this is an effort to build some bridges before we talk about some issues which may be a little more divisive. So, bear with me. Clap if you or a sibling were ever grounded for getting an A-minus in any class. 
Please. One young lady here is clapping a whole lot. She must have got a few A minuses. Now, stay with me. Clap if you call everyone older than you auntie or uncle, even if you have no idea whether they're related to you. <laughs> Clap if you've ever eaten spam on purpose, or if you think, or there you go, spam's gonna get its own clap, or if you think rice should be its own food group. Now, clap, speaking of rice, if you measure the ratio of rice to water using the finger or knuckle method ever. Thank you. You who may not be very familiar with our culture, um, if you ever cook rice, you might look on the side of the rice cooker and their little numbers. Uh, we ignore those. Um, we instead insert a digit. It's much more scientific that way to cook good rice. Clap if you or your family have ever come back from the islands with huge taped up boxes of frozen foods that you can't buy here. Just clap on that one, come on. I know you islanders out there, especially the Pacific Island community, or the Balikbayan boxes, I know those. And finally, I'm gonna cut these short in the interest of time. Clap if you have ever thought that karaoke should be an Olympic sport. <laughs> Someone said it's not. Um, next Olympics are in Japan, though. I think maybe we, we have a shot. Again, um, and thank you for indulging that as well. It really is an honor to speak with you today. You who are leaders in the Asian Pacific American community, whether you're first gen or multi gen, recently arrived or well settled, Republican, Democrat, or other, your sacrifices to come to this country, to be the first to attend college in your family, perhaps to be the fourth generation of valedictorian and run the family business, the sacrifices to make our communities better, to raise strong families, build thriving companies, all of these sacrifices and efforts have not gone unnoticed by Donald Trump or the Republican Party. You are such a critical strength to our nation and your influence as leaders in the APA community and ability to do good here domestically and around the world will only increase. Why is that? The APA demographic, as we all know, is growing rapidly. Pew Research says Asian Americans are the highest income, best educated, and fastest growing racial group in the United States. With Asians now making up the largest share of recent immigrants and Pacific Islanders are growing in numbers and influence as well. The contributions by APAs to America are enormous. In business, the arts, journalism, technology, science, academia, law, medicine, film, cuisine, literature, policy, government, I could go on and on and on. Donald Trump appreciates these significant contributions. He sends his thanks and expresses tremendous respect towards the accomplishments of APAs nationwide. And let me add, I myself as an APA I'm fiercely proud of all that we have been able to do together to build America. So thank you again for letting me address you. Thank you, you can clap if you want. I see a few clappers. Thank you for letting me address you. Thank you for staying also, um, any of you. I realize that I'm not a headliner like others who preceded me on the stage, but I think my being here says something very important about Donald Trump and Governor Mike Pence. And that is the fact that they would allow an average person like me to be able to speak to a group as important as you. I think it speaks to the emphasis that they've made on protecting the average American. And by the way, I also wanna thank the Secret Service for finally giving me clearance to actually come out on stage and speak. Thank you, <laughs> guys, appreciate it. I think they just thought I was another attendee who was lost or someone trying to sneak up on the stage to ask another question which is kind of ironic because in my state, when I stand next to the governor, a lot of visitors think I'm part of his security detail. And when he says, no, this is the top law enforcement official, or so this is our elected attorney general, many of them say, oh, okay, now we know who he is, but what is he? So I get that question a lot, what are you? It's always hard to respond. I don't know, what are you? Um, American, 
earthling, father, husband, Pokemon Go fan. I mean, there are a lot of different things. It's kind of sad when the Pokemon Go line gets more applause than anything else. And, and now you've outed yourself because I see you there flinging Pokeballs during my speech. But usually I think they're asking about when they say, what are you, my heritage? So, in case any of you were wondering, I gave you a little clue with the initial greetings. My mother, who, um, um, who I just lost last year, was half Japanese and half Native Hawaiian. On her Japanese side, she was a Maeda from Clan Maeda that built Kanazawa Castle and Ishikawa Ken. She was third generation, or sensei. Her grandfather came to work in the sugarcane fields of Hawaii. I often ask my mom, well, if great-grandpa was Issei, grandpa's Nisei, your sensei, what say am I? And she said, you know what, son, your generation is called do what I say. It's, it's really yonsei, and my kids are gosei, and my mom would say, yeah, it's go to work say for your kids, too. That's, that was mom. You would have loved her. On her Hawaiian side, she was born and raised in North Kohala on the Big Island. Any Hawaii folks out there? Right? Thank you. It was the home of her ancestor, King Kamehameha Mo'i the first. Her mother, Matutuwahine, grew up in a Kona fishing village, speaking native Hawaiian as her first language. Now, as for dad, he is Spanish and Filipino. His Spanish ancestors on both sides of his family settled in the Philippines. And after several generations of marrying beautiful and native, beautiful native Filipinos, a wonderful fusion of Spanish and Filipino traditions and culture nurtured my father as he grew up in the Philippines. And lest anyone question my Filipino street cred, yes, I can eat bulut, I can eat bagong, and dinaguan. So afterwards, we can talk, a little Filipino foods. But I want to share a little bit more about my parents and uh, their journey and an evolution. You know, my, almost 50 years ago now, my father fled in his 20s, his beloved homeland of the Philippines. And it was a mere decade or so before that his godfather, it was really his, his cousin, but he called him uncle, Ramon Magsaysay, great president of the Philippines, had brought the Philippines to a great point in its history. My dad also himself had experienced a lot of success. He toured singing uh, with Bob Hope um, on the USO tour. He had been asked personally by the Pope to paint his portrait, which hung in the Vatican. He had his own radio and TV show, had been a line producer for MGM at the age of 15, had accomplished so much, but why would he leave all of this behind? was a loss of liberty, a president who rose to power, who thought he was above the law, a president who was truly, in every aspect of the word, a politician rather than a public servant. My father was too outspoken and um, eventually had to leave in order for his safety. He came here to the United States to seek protection. And his greatest day, he tells me, aside from marrying my mom, um, even more than um, watching us uh, kids be born. He said his greatest day was becoming an American citizen. As a small business owner struggling to make ends meet in Los Angeles and raise a small family, he felt the Republican Party helped him the most. He felt that they were the most compassionate party, the most fiscally sound, the most conducive to family values and principles of hard work and self-reliance, and he became a Republican. Now my mom, was born, again, in Hawaii. It's a very blue state, as you well know. When she graduated from college and began a 40-year career in education, she was still surrounded by many friends who were Democrats. But she became disenchanted with a union-dominated system that seemed not to be a meritocracy, where entitlements that enabled rather than empowered and tax and spend policies by state and federal Democrats made her finally say, enough. She joined the Republican Party. And so, I became a Republican at a very early age. One year old, I had Richard Nixon pajamas on. But like my family, going back to my mom and dad, I think people today around the nation are also saying, enough. Challenging some of their 
traditions and paradigms. And why are they saying that? Many of you are business leaders here in the audience today. And let's start with the economy. Now I want to get into some more statistics and some more hard facts about the Obama policies of the last eight years, which Secretary Clinton has embraced. Their policies produced 1.2% growth, the weakest so-called recovery since the Great Depression and a doubling of the national debt. There are now 94.3 million Americans outside the labor force. It was 80.5 million when President Obama took office, an increase of nearly 14 million people. The Obama-Clinton agenda of tax, spend, and regulate has created a silent nation of jobless Americans. Home ownership is at its lowest rate in 51 years. Nearly 12 million have been added to the food stamp rolls since President Obama took office, and another nearly 7 million Americans were added to those ranks or to the ranks of those in poverty. We have the lowest labor force participation rate in four decades. 58% of African American youth are either outside the labor force or not employed, and one in five American households do not have a single member in the labor force. Now these are the real unemployment numbers. The 5% figures that they, that they bandy about, those are some of the biggest hoaxes in modern politics. Meanwhile, American households are earning more than $4,000 less today than they were 16 years ago. The average worker today pays 31.5% of their wages to income and payroll taxes. And on top of that, stake in lo local taxes consume another approximately 10%. Similarly, the U.S. has the highest business tax rate among the major industrialized nations of the world at 35%. It's almost 40% when you factor in taxes at the state level. In other words, we punish companies for making products in America, but let them ship products into the U.S. tax-free if they move overseas. Now let me tell you about Donald Trump's approach to the economy and his vision. He will revamp our economic policy to ensure that all Asian Pacific Americans can achieve the American dream. He will provide tax relief to middle class Americans and increase take home pay, streamlining and simplifying the tax code to ease the burden on APAs and all Americans. Our current trade policy allows countries like China and Mexico to take American jobs. Mr. Trump believes in restoring jobs which have been outsourced to foreign countries to ensure that every American, including every Asian Pacific American, can have a well-paying job. He will close the tax code loopholes that corporations have exploited to dodge taxes. For too long, America has been losing to foreign interests, but no more. Mr. Trump believes in, a, in America first, no exceptions. Now, another thing that I'm impressed about, Mr. Trump's vision for the economy, he will rein in federal regulators who put more and more burdens on Asian Pacific American small business owners, from convenience store owners, nail salons, restaurant owners, to those who offer professional services like doctors, lawyers, and accountants. These federal agencies are run by unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats who have created a fourth branch of government. They've never owned a small business. They've never run one. They've never sacrificed to start one or to make payroll or take care of their employees, yet they create laws without congressional approval, making it much more difficult to get needed capital to start and run a business, and forcing small Asian Pacific American businesses to pay more for health care, overtime, and taxes. These administrative laws number in the tens of thousands. I think the, the Federal Register is over 80,000 pages of these additional administrative laws passed outside again the purview of Congress, burdening the everyday American and the small business owner. Some estimates are that these federal overregulations cost our country $2 trillion a year. Donald Trump will put an end to this unconstitutional burden being laid on the backs of hardworking, tax-paying, law-abiding Asian Pacific American business owners. Now, without the burden of overregulation, small businesses can flourish. And let me be clear, small businesses, they are the heart and soul, the lifeblood of our economy. 
Just yesterday, I penned a letter of support for the Pacific Island Business Alliance in Utah, praising them for building a community of support and sharing resources. In Hawaii, the spirit of kokua, or support, is not just a superficial one. It's almost a sacred duty to help your neighbors, to pay it forward, to give back. Not reliant on government, but reliant on themselves and each other to succeed. Government can be a catalyst, but not the answer to every problem. That is what Donald Trump believes, putting money back in your pockets and into your businesses and lessening governor, government interference is one way that we will make the American economy grow again. Now, when it comes to education, Donald Trump understands the APA's community, the community's need for high quality education, and that education is a student's ticket to the American dream. He understands moms like mine, tiger moms, who sacrifice so much and expect so much. My mom once grounded me for an entire summer because I got an A minus, an AP calculus. In law school, I got a sub A grade, and she tried to do that again, but I was 25 and told her mom, I don't think you can keep doing that. But he understands, as I understand, the great desire to better our lives and our communities through education. Common Core, which the Democrat Party continues to push for, has taken control of education out of local school administrators in favor of DC bureaucrats, creating less freedom. Parents should also have the opportunity to choose the schools that their children attend, whether that's public, private, or charter. Mr. Trump is a strong supporter of school choice, which drives high standards and ensures that students are attending the best schools possible. More freedom. Mr. Trump firmly opposes race-based standards imposed by affirmative action programs, which limit the potential of APA students and job speakers, seekers, excuse me. Now you know and I know well that APAs are often discriminated against by affirmative action programs. When I was at the University of California, Berkeley for Law School, there was a joke that the acronym for our sister school at UCLA was underrepresented Caucasians lost amongst Asians. And that has had that perception or that reality a negative impact on admissions for well-deserving, hardworking Asian students. Let me share with you an example of more diversity, which I think is a tremendous aspiration. Diversity is definitely a good thing, and we can agree on that. Republicans embrace diversity. But without affirmative action, when I took office just a few years ago, women and minorities in leadership were highly underrepresented. Rather than targeting a particular quota or implementing an affirmative action plan, I fired everyone, let everyone apply who thought they had enough talent, regardless of the letter next to their name politically, regardless of their religious background in a very religious state, regardless of who they know. It was all about who was the best, who could make the most difference, who was the most dedicated. And lo and behold, once we made our hires based purely on merit, the amount of women more than doubled, the amount of minorities increased exponentially because for the first time they had a level playing field. They had a chance to prove that they were the best. We gave them that opportunity. And I know Mr. Trump agrees with that approach. To ease the burden, finally, of student debt, he will not allow the federal government to profit from student loans. Now, let me take a moment to talk about health care. It was raised earlier several times by the other candidates or proxies. Donald J. Trump will fully repeal and replace the Obamacare burden, which has driven up health care costs across the country and has not improved the quality of care for average Americans. Less freedom. A Trump administration will allow insurance companies to compete in a free market across state lines. Competition will decrease costs and increase quality of care. Once more, more freedom. Mr. Trump will promote tax-free health savings accounts and allow individuals to deduct health care payments from their tax returns. To better provide for low-income 
APAs, and their health care needs, Mr. Trump will give control of Medicaid to the states, which are best equipped to administer these services. More freedom. For our APA veterans, Mr. Trump believes in fixing the broken VA system and paying private doctors to ensure that our heroes, and he truly believes that our military men and women are heroes, that they will receive the proper treatment they deserve for defending our country. If you want to clap, you can clap as loud as you want right there. So some timid claps. To improve the affordability of prescription drugs, a Trump administration will reduce barriers to entry to a free market for manufacturers of pharmaceuticals. Donald Trump understands the importance of America's safety and protecting our APA communities. Under the Obama and Clinton foreign policy, America's national security has been compromised and foreign aggression has increased. I don't think there's any way around that. I think no matter how you spin that, that is the reality of how the world is and how we are perceived. Radical Islam has become an international plague and many innocent lives have been lost. And again, I'm talking about radical Islam, not law-abiding, God-fearing, Muslim neighbors and friends. We're talking about a specific subset who are terrorists. And I spent yesterday time with a governor from uh, an allied nation. A few weeks ago, several attorneys general from another um, nation. And it was their perception. They were worried for us. They said, Sean, America is still great, but America is not perceived to be strong anymore. And that worries us for you, and that worries us for us, because if America is not perceived as strong, we, your allies, are in danger as well. By fixing our foreign policy and ramping our efforts against radical terrorists, we can ensure that the American homeland is kept secure. We will secure our borders to ensure that all Asian Americans can prosper in a safe country free from foreign criminal organizations and trafficking. And when I say trafficking, I'm talking about narco-trafficking or human trafficking. Mr. Trump is very supportive of my efforts along with a lot of us in law enforcement to liberate the 20 to 40 million estimated modern-day slaves who are victims of that horrific institution of human trafficking, the fastest growing and perhaps most lucrative criminal enterprise right now. It's hard to tell if it's surpassed narco trafficking. The traffickers don't respond to our survey monkeys, so it's really hard to get real-time data. But Mr. Trump is very supportive of the efforts, not just to liberate them, but to have resources for the victims, the survivors, for the mental health, physical health, emotional, educational needs that they have as they try to piece their lives back together and heal from being victims. Now, let me make a couple points about immigration. And I want to clarify, first of all, some comments that Mr. Trump made about the Philippines. And being Filipino, those issues are near and dear to my heart. What Mr. Trump was trying to communicate and I have full authority to make this clarification, was that he welcomes law-abiding Filipinos who want to come and have a better life or better opportunities, whether they want to live here or go back to the Philippines, send money back to their families there. He welcomes them. They shouldn't be waiting in, long, in lines as long as they have. I have relatives who waited for over 20 years to come to this country legally, and so we do need to do something about that. But he was talking about specifically terrorist elements that do exist in the Philippines, and there's no one here from the Philippines who can dispute that. They know that that exists, and that is what Mr. Trump was talking about. He understands the importance of promoting legal immigration, because illegal immigration has cost American taxpayers billions and billions of dollars, and the Democrat administration has failed to deport illegal immigrants who have committed violent crimes, many of whom still roam the streets. That is why Mr. Trump believes in tripling the number of border agents to ensure that lawful citizens are protected. Increased border security will help restore the integrity of our borders and keep illegal aliens, criminal organizations, and contraband from crossing over. A Trump administration will reform the broken visa program 
which encourages American employers to choose foreign workers over domestic workers. He will always put American workers, including Asian Pacific American workers, first. When it comes to law enforcement and first responders and the military, Mr. Trump is an absolute supporter of our men and women in uniform. While there are instances, tragic instances, of police violence and abuse, and we have to, as a law enforcement community, address those, and we are, across the aisle, in a bipartisan way, to make sure that the communities that we police are not victimized by those who are there to protect them. But the vast majority, day in and day out, of law enforcement, men and women, are tremendous public servants who don't deserve the invective and the rhetoric that has been hurled their way. Mr. Trump stands behind our men and women in uniform who every day run towards danger while we run away from it. Again, thank you. Well, I hope that, I hope that clap is for all of those brave men and women. I have many officers um, in my state, as General Masto had when she was Attorney General. I pray for them and their families every single day for their safe return. Mr. Trump also supports other things that are critical to me, addressing the opioid addiction, this rampant opioid addiction that indiscriminately reaches out and touches all of us, regardless of affluence, regardless of political affiliation. And we must work together to address those issues. Criminal justice reform, teen suicide intervention, spiking numbers of teens who can't hide from cyber bullies, who are dealing with problems that they think they can't deal with. Again, we need to come together to work on those. Mr. Trump is supportive of that. Finally, white collar fraud, which is rampant throughout our country. Cases that rob tens of billions of dollars from the most innocent, particularly impactful on our senior communities, Ponzi scams and schemes. He will be aggressive in helping us deal with these without adding layer upon layer upon layer of governmental regulation. Let me say, too, that I think perhaps the most critical issue, and I'm biased because I'm an attorney general, and part of my job is to practice in front of the United States Supreme Court, the most important issue or critical issue in this election is the Supreme Court. And who will make the next one, two, three, or four nominations for justices to the high court? That will alter the trajectory of our nation, of our soul and our culture far longer than either of these candidates could possibly serve as president. And I want you to think about that and think about how much the court impacts our lives. But what's not talked about a lot is that while the Supreme Court is critically important, the next president will also appoint circuit court justices. These are the appellate courts that impact us on a day-to-day -day basis, sometimes more than SCOTUS. Federal district court judges, hundreds around the country who will make the critical decisions about rights, benefits, burdens, constitutional privileges. So when you think about the election, please don't forget the Supreme Court. I truly believe that is one of the most, if not the most important issues. Now, winding down, I do wanna again express appreciation for the Trump campaign, which has been working closely with the Republican National Committee in reaching out to Asian Pacific Americans. We may not agree on everything. Some of you, we may not agree on anything but it's critical that we come and listen in humility, with respect, like Floyd Morey and I do. I don't think Floyd and I agree on much politically, but there is a great deal of respect. And one thing that I can agree with those who've come before me to speak here at this day is, today is that we do better when we can reach out and work together on these critical issues. The Republican National Committee has been integral in getting Republican message out to the APA community and has been actively engaging them through events like summits, conventions, and conferences. The Trump campaign works closely with grassroots groups such as the National Diversity Coalition for Trump, and he understands the importance of America's growing APA community and will continue to work with the community as our next president to ensure that their American dream is fulfilled. Now I wanna share with you a contrast 
Donald Trump does not need this job. He's leaving his businesses and a comfortable life to give public service. I want to compare just using the state of New York in contrast the vision and approach of Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. The Washington Post published a devastating article on Secretary Clinton's broken promises. She pledged 200,000 jobs for upstate New York as a senator, but what happened? The Post writes, and I quote, upstate job growth stagnated overall during her tenure, with manufacturing jobs plunging nearly 25%. The former first lady was unable to pass big ticket legislation. Many promised jobs never materialized, and others migrated to other states as she turned to her first presidential run. Data shows that upstate actually lost jobs during her first term. Compare that to Donald Trump's record. In a recent New York Post article by Steve Cuoso, which is titled, How Donald Trump Helped Save New York City, the paper writes that Mr. Trump, and again, this is a direct quote, waded into a landscape of empty Fifth Avenue storefronts, the dust bowl mugging ground that was Central Park and a Wall Street area seemingly on its last legs as companies moved out. He did this all almost by force of will. He rode to the rescue. Expressing rare faith in the future, he was instrumental in kickstarting the regeneration of neighborhoods and landmarks almost given up for dead. That is the Donald Trump that I know. That is the vision that I'm excited about. I want to be frank. I was not immediately a supporter of Donald Trump. It took me a while. I don't agree with everything that he says, but to be honest, I don't even agree with myself 100% of the time. But when I carefully considered his track record, his track record of success, his willingness to stand up to power and speak to it, to break through gridlock and old ideas, and when I considered his commitment to his family, hard work, self-reliance, less burdensome reg regulations, and a dedication to faith and freedom, those are my values as an Asian Pacific American. I want visionary leadership, not the status quo. I want a new future and not old, unworkable ideas from the past. I humbly invite you to join me in supporting the next president of the United States, Donald J. Trump. Now, before I close, and because I'm not taking questions because I have a plane to catch in a few minutes, um, several reporters asked me, uh, it's a little unorthodox, and it really has nothing to do with Mr. Trump, if I would rap. Um, they knew that I grew up rapping, and um, I will very quickly give you one and then go on my way so that I can say that I at least answered some media questions. Because we're in Las Vegas, and this is the mecca for a lot of boxing matches, some of the greatest of all times, and because recently one of my um, sports heroes, Muhammad Ali, passed away, I have a little rap dedicated to boxing and, uh, and what I do as Attorney General. It goes a little something like this. Because I'm an innovating, devastating, rhyming AG, repping 801 Utah SLC. Don't waste your time trying to battle me because I knock you out. You're Frazier. I'm Ali. Yes, Ali, a.k.a. Cassius Clay. You want to take my title, best step away. Political pugilist, I don't play. You feeling lucky, punk? Come on and make my day. Because I will rope a dope, give you hope to your best hits. And when I'm standing there smiling, you know I'm legit. Because you'll be punched out, tired, ready to sit. And then I'll rain down blows till you beg me to quit. Round 1 of 15, it don't mean a thing. It's who's wearing the belt when we step out of this ring. So I'll overcome whatever you bring, because I'm the undisputed heavyweight and pound-for-pound pound king. Hunting predators, I'm a dragon slayer, making believers out of all them haters as I take down in my town criminals like a bloodhound on the scent till they're found. Follow them even underground, infiltrate their compounds, engulf them like surround sound. Don't mess around in my town, I'll take you down. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, God bless you. and have a wonderful, wonderful conference. Thank you.